In August of 2001, I went to United States Marine Corps boot camp. And at that time, I had no idea that the military had ever used dogs in any way. Exactly three years later, in August of 2004, I found myself working as a dog handler searching for explosives and weapons caches with my military working dog, Rex, tattoo number Echo 168, in an area known as the Triangle of Death in the Iraq War. We had a very successful deployment, meaning we did what was asked of us, and we came home safe and sound. But it turns out that dog teams in the military have been very successful for, for a very, very long time. Starting in World War I, they weren't officially used, but dogs were adopted as mascots by military units to take overseas as morale boosters. The most famous of those mascots was Sergeant Stubby, a bull terrier. He went into combat. He actually found uh, wounded troops on the battlefield, and he himself was wounded several times. But he recovered, came home, lived a, lived a long life, met a couple of United States presidents, and his preserves are, uh, remain in the uh, Smithsonian today. Officially, dogs were inducted into the military and used for working purposes in World War II. Right after Pearl Harbor, an organization called the Dogs for Defense went around the country and asked people to donate their pets for the war effort, which they did. About 10,000 dogs served in World War II, and they were extremely successful and were recognized and given citations for all their accomplishments. In the Korean War, they also accomplished many, many great acts of valor. Uh, many scout dog platoons served. And they, again, were given multiple citations and awards for all their uh, accomplishments overseas and in warfare. Moving on to Vietnam, 4,000 war dogs served, and it's estimated that they saved a minimum of 10,000 lives. So as you can see, they've been extremely successful, and yet people had no idea what their purpose is or the fact that they're even used. So why does the military use dogs? Well, if you think about it, what, is, what do we re rely on most out of all of our senses? It's our, eyes, it's our vision, our sight. Well, with dogs, it's their nose and their detection capabilities. A dog interprets the world through its nose, much how we interpret it through sight. The percentage of the dog's brain that is devoted to analyzing smells is 40 times larger than that of a, of a human. They can identify scents about 10,000 times better than humans. And it's estimated that dogs can detect odors up to 40 feet underground and capable of detecting odors up to two parts per trillion. So why is that so important to the military? Why is that so useful to us? Well, because when we're on the battlefield, we can only see what we can see. We can't see what we can't see, but dogs can because of their nose. So if there's an ambush waiting for us or something that's hidden like a booby trap or an explosive, and they can detect it, they can alert us to that danger, therefore saving lives. Today, that capability is needed more than ever because the enemy's favorite tool is what you call, or favorite weapon, is an IED, improvised explosive device. Since 2001, around 600 US service members have been killed in action by IEDs, and roughly 7,000 more have been wounded. And that includes women and children, because they're non-discriminant and victim-operated, which means once they're planted and hidden, whoever steps on that explosive is going to go off, regardless if it's a, an American troop or if it's a civilian walking down the road. IEDs are, H, are made from HME, homemade explosives. Uh, they're very cheap to make. Most commonly today, they're made from ammonium nitrate, a chemical found in fertilizer. Now, the reason why I mention that is because the majority of these bombs have very little metal involved in, in making them. So when you plant them, it's very hard for metal detectors to find them. To give you a sense of how much the enemy relies on this uh, weapon to attack us, in 2007, around 3,000 IED attacks occurred in Afghanistan. In 2009, that number jumped to over 9,000. Two years later, in 2011, over 16,000 IED attacks and this year, they're going to have the same amount, if not more. So as you can tell, it's their uh, favorite weapon to use today, and the dogs are, used, uh, are the number one tool to counter that weapon. It's such an issue with us that the military actually created an entire unit devoted to countering that weapon. It's called the Joint, uh, Joint IED Defeat Organization. Their sole purpose is to find out how to defeat the IEDs. It was created in 2006, and they actually came out with a report in 2010 after spending $19 billion, they created lots of great technology and training programs to help us defeat IEDs, but they still found, after six years and $19 billion later, that bomb detector dogs and their handlers are still the best tools in finding IEDs. We like to refer to them as weapons of mass detection. 
Around 50% of all IEDs are located before they detonate, and that number increases to 80% when troops have an explosive sniffing dog team. Uh, again, we have all these tools to find them, but the number one, or one, uh, one of the most vital, is the uh, bomb detection dog team. So much that generals, our, our celebrated generals of today, our leaders, uh, are recognizing them. General David Petraeus. <laughs> hey. He's a great military leader. A lot of respect for the man, and he actually came out and said, the capability military working dogs are bringing to the fight cannot be replicated by man or machine. By all measures of performance, they, their yield outperforms any asset we have in our inventory. Our army and military would be remiss if we failed to invest more in this incredibly valuable resource. So let me explain to you what makes a dog team so great, because we all know the capabilities of their detection, and we know that they're a great morale booster. But the secret of what makes the military dog team so great, and it's called a team for a reason. You, need to, you can't just have a great dog or a great handler. They need to have a relationship amongst each other, and that, they rely on that relationship more than anything. It is the number one reason why dog teams are so effective is because of how strong that connection that handler has with his dog. And I'm here to tell you the five steps it takes in order to establish the greatest connection possible so you can be an effective working dog team. And what's great about these steps is that you can apply them in your own life and hopefully develop even better personal relationships. <laughs> so beginning with step number one, build rapport. So what does building rapport mean? Well, it's you already know as a handler what your intention is. You're going to go in there, you want to make the best of that dog, you want to do him right, and you want to be there for him all the time. Well, he, he doesn't know that. He has no idea what your intention is. You need, he, he needs to know that he can trust you. So you can't just walk in there giving him commands and start training. You have to let him get comfortable with you. As a Marine, we're taught uh, to maintain our weapons at all times in top working condition, oil them, clean them, uh, keep good maintenance on them every single day. They teach us that. They drill that home in our heads. Well, the same attention to detail that we're supposed to give to our weapons, handlers need to give to their dogs. So how do we do that? Well, we groom them every single day. This isn't every other day. This isn't once a week. Every single day, sometimes several times a day, you need to look at their toenails, look at their ears for infections, make sure their teeth are clean, uh, make sure they aren't developing any infect skin infections or rashes, check for dehydration. You're constantly being aware of your dog to make sure they're in top working condition and healthy at all times. There, that's myself right there with Rex uh, in Iraq, giving him a full medical inspection. What's funny about Rex is that he wouldn't just sit there. He actually had to knock him out to do a medical inspection. <laughs> some, dogs, some dogs are a little feisty. Uh, daily exercise. Now, this is, you take them out, it's, it's a game to the dog. You have fun with them. They want, now you're building rapport, excuse me, they're trusting you, they want you to come take them out every single day and they look forward to it now. When you take them out to exercise, for example, this is me taking Rex out to the hills, uh, uh, the Camp Pendleton Hills before we deployed. I would just keep him in good, top working condition. His health was, was, was really good and as long as he was out there feeling good, he would want to work for me and build up that drive. You also get to, get to know the little nuances when you take them out to exercises, what kind of games they like to play, what kind of toys like they like to play with, and you use that while you, uh, when you take them out training. Step number two, reward good behavior. What's funny about Rex, and he's such a good looking dog, <laughs> he was very uh, uh, picky. Whenever I gave him a toy, if, I would always give him this little dog treat, right, about this big, and he'd take it and spit it right back out. So I gave him another big one. It was about medium size. He'd take it, hold it in his mouth for a second, spit it out. So I got him that huge mammoth bone. And I, I couldn't pry that thing out of his mouth. <laughs> so you find out what motivates them. And when they do something, you better reward them so that they will do it again. And they build up a drive to want to do it again. The most basic way of rewarding our dogs is through praise. This is so important, and it's critical. It's probably the most important thing that you can learn as a handler is how to praise your dog. It's so important that we, when we go to handler's course, the, very fir the first few days that we're there, we're not even, even allowed to touch a dog. We have a bucket filled with cement that we put a leash to that we pretend is our dog, and they teach us to practice how to talk and praise our dog. So, and by the way, it all ends with praise. A command voice is a normal tone that you give to your dog, uh, asking it a basic task, Rex, sit. That's a normal tone. I just gave him a basic command. That's my command voice. Rex, sit. Rex, heal. Rex, down. Things like that. 
And then when he does it, you praise him. Oh, good boys! <laughs> right? <laughs> that's all you got. That's, that's all it takes. Uh, correction voice. A correction voice uh, is not there so you can stress the dog out. It's just to remind them that they're not doing what you asked them to do. You only use it very quickly and as efficient as possible, and you quickly move on to a command so that you can set them up to be praised and end in praise. You always keep it positive. So, Rex, sit. No, sit. Oh, good boys. <laughs> Just like that. It's so simple, right? People try and make it complicated. They really like the more silly you look, actually, the more you're doing it right. So when I, when I say, oh, good boys, because he did something basic, if he does something I really wanted him to do that he hasn't done, uh, and he finally clicked with them. He finally got it. Like, for example, I tried to get him to jump over a six-foot wall for the longest time, and he finally accomplished it. I might, as soon as he did, I'd be like, Whoa, Rexy, good boys. I love doing that. And when I hear a handler doing that, we, we, we enjoy it, and we make fun of each other, but we have a good time. <laughs> Number three, emotions run down and up leash. So you're taking them out uh, to exercise, getting physical with them. They need to know that you're there emotionally for them as well, and vice versa. Okay, this is very, very important to know. You have an energy that goes between you that goes down that leash and right back up, and you're feeding off of that energy every single day. So if you have personal baggage that you're coming into work with and you bring that into work, that's going to affect your dog's behavior as well. He's not going to be as motivated because he knows you're not as motivated. Well, it's vice versa. If they're not feeling well, you don't want to put that added stress on them uh, and have them perform any unnecessary tasks because it's just going to keep them out of the, uh, out of the fight for a much longer time. You know, when I was in Iraq, you know, we had some bad issues going on every, time, every once in a while, and I just kind of sit there in silence, and he'd just jump on my bed and just lay there with me. No, no, no words were, were needed to be spoken. They understand. Four, recognize change of behaviors. This is extremely important. When your dog's on odor, how do you know? Well, their tail might start wagging, their ears might, their ears might slightly turn back. You need to understand as a handler what behaviors your dog displays when it's on an odor. It's going to save your life. You also need to know their personalities. <laughs> so, for example, Rex was such a good-looking dog, and as long as you were remaining calm, he was remaining calm and confident. We call him Sexy Rexy. But I also knew what set him off. And when that happened, he was known as Tyrannosaurus Rex or T-Rex. So as a handler, you need to know your dog's personalities because you need to know how he might re react in any given situation. Lastly, you need to trust your dog. You spent all this time training and developing that bond and working with your dog. You need to trust the fact that he knows what he's doing. That first step about building rapport and getting your dog comfortable with you is more for your dog to trust you. Well, now that he does, he's willing to give his life for you. So you need to trust him to know that he's going to do what's expected of him. And when the time comes, when, the, when, the, when your life is on the line, he's going to perform. And thankfully, Rex did. When we were in Iraq, he found several caches and weapons and explosives. I gave him plenty of mammoth bones to reward him, and he wanted to get back up and do it right back, uh, do it right back again. And that bond and that relationship that you build with that animal or any human being, when you, as long as you follow all those steps, that lasts a lifetime, and they're going to live a long, happy, working life, performing, and they're not, it's not work to them at that point. They're doing it just for the love of being loved. They just, that's all that they want. And that's what anybody wants, right? So I got to meet Rex when he was a puppy, one and a half years old. We deployed together uh, when he was three, and he retired when he was 10. Lived a long, good life. He's retired now. He's living a good life. Thank God. I was fortunate to take him on his first combat deployment in Iraq in 2004. He did a very successful job. I was actually one of 10 handlers that handled Rex. I taught, and we're all taught as handlers, how to, how to create that bond. And he actually had to create that bond with, with ten, uh, nine other handlers after me, which he did. He went on to do three combat deployments, found hundreds of weapons and caches and explosives. He did several presidential tours protecting presidents. It's just an amazing dog. And if you do it right, if you, if you create this bond and this relationship in the right way, they're going to live a very long time, and they're going to retire happy. The average dog does about eight, six to seven years in the military, or six to eight years. Uh, Rex did 10. You did, and that's a long time for a dog. So, build rapport, reward good behavior, emotions run down and up leash, recognize change of behaviors, trust your dog.
These are the five steps that you as a handler need to do to create that special bond, that unbreakable bond with your dog so that you can be the most effective dog team you can in the military. And if you look at that and really think about it, how do you think you can apply that into your own life and really establish great personal relationships amongst your friends and family? Finally, I wanted to note that Rex's success, along with all of military working dog success in the past and today and in the future is gonna be recognized officially. The National Military Working Dog Monument was approved by Congress. It's gonna be dedicated next year. It's the first time an animal of any kind has been raised to a national monument status. So I hope, and by the way, it's gonna be dedicated at Lackland Air Force Base, which is where Military Working Dog Handling Course is located at, uh, in San Antonio, Texas. And so I hope if you guys are ever down there in that area, you can go pay a visit and uh, pay your respects and be connected to the canine community uh, within the U.S. military, because we're all heroes. Thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. Thanks. <laughs>